when Britain says it will build a new nuclear attack submarine every 18 months, it's not just setting an industrial target. It's rewriting its role in the balance of global naval power. The latest UK Strategic Defence Review lays out something the country hasn't attempted in decades, a continuous rhythm-based submarine production cycle that will sustain Britain's nuclear undersea fleet well into the 2040s. It's a plan that blends Cold War intensity with 21st century geopolitical urgency. And it's all happening under the banner of AUKUS. Let's be clear, this isn't about prestige projects or symbolic defence spending. The 18-month rhythm announced by London represents a structural shift in how the Royal Navy maintains power projection beneath the waves, through expanded capacity at BAE systems in Barrow-in-Furness and Rolls-Royce's Rainsway nuclear facility. The UK aims to deliver up to 12 next-generation nuclear-powered attack submarines, jointly designed with the United States and Australia. In short, the UK isn't just building submarines, it's building a system that never stops building. Why now? Because the era of slow, episodic shipbuilding is over. The world's oceans are once again the front lines of competition. The People's Liberation Army Navy has expanded faster than any navy since World War II. Analysts estimate that China could operate up to 70 submarines by 2035, including new nuclear variants. The message from London is clear. If deterrence is to remain credible, the Royal Navy cannot afford pauses in production or gaps in capability. At the heart of this new strategy is the AUKUS submarine program the trilateral pact linking Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Its first pillar, focused on nuclear submarine capability, is transforming from theory into hardware. Britain's role is pivotal. It will lead in design, produce early hulls, and supply propulsion technology for a joint fleet that will operate across the Indo-Pacific. The United States, in turn, will provide combat systems and reactor technologies, while Australia prepares to host and eventually build its own boats by the late 2030s. The program's centerpiece, the SSN AUKUS, sometimes called SSNA, is a generational leap in submarine design. It will blend British stealth architecture with American combat technology from the Virginia class. These submarines will be larger, faster, and more heavily armed than the current astute class, equipped with vertical launch cells and expanded payload capacity. They will be fully interoperable across Allied fleets, allowing British, Australian, and American submarines to share data, coordinate missions, and operate as a single undersea network. And that's the key, interoperability. AUKUS is more than procurement alignment. It's about creating an integrated undersea ecosystem. For decades, Britain's Royal Navy has struggled to sustain momentum between submarine classes. The gap between the Trafalgar and Astute programs nearly crippled the industry. The new 18-month cycle eliminates that risk. One submarine finishes construction. The next begins immediately. This continuity doesn't just sustain technical know-how. It institutionalizes it. Every engineer, welder, and systems technician remains engaged, ensuring no loss of skill or capacity. It's a rhythm Britain hasn't seen since the height of the Cold War, when the Royal Navy's submarine force expanded to counter the Soviet Union's massive underwater fleet. The difference today is scope. This time, Britain isn't going it alone. AUKUS aligns industrial bases across three nations, pooling research, supply chains, and workforce pipelines. Rolls-Royce's new nuclear campus in Derby will produce reactor cores for both British and Australian submarines while Australian engineers will rotate through Barrow to gain experience before building their own boats in Adelaide. From a defence industrial standpoint, this is a masterstroke. Continuous production ensures predictable demand, stabilising the workforce and attracting long-term investment. It also grants political resilience. Once a production line like this starts, it becomes extremely difficult, both economically and strategically, to halt it. The program thus anchors Britain's defence economy to a consistent, decades-long cycle of high-technology manufacturing, mirroring the model long practised by the United States with its Virginia-class production lines. But beyond the economic narrative lies the strategic one. Britain's decision to institutionalise submarine production is a statement about permanence, about the Royal Navy's enduring place within the nuclear deterrent triad. Today, the UK operates six Astute-class attack submarines and four Vanguard-class ballistic missile submarines. The Vanguards provide the nation's nuclear deterrent, while the Astutes handle reconnaissance, intelligence, and precision strike missions. As the Astutes approach retirement in the 2030s, the SSN AUKUS class will take their place, ensuring there is no capability gap in the Royal Navy's ability to operate independently or alongside allies. Yet the ambitions of AUKUS reach far beyond the Atlantic. The Indo-Pacific is now the gravitational center of maritime competition. By the time the first SSN AUKUS boats enter service, Australia will have joined the Nuclear Submarine Club, something that was unthinkable only a few years ago. The US, facing stretched capacity at its own yards, 
is encouraging this British-led expansion as it frees American resources for its Columbia-class ballistic missile submarines. In essence, the AUKUS model divides labor across the alliance, design and early builds in the UK, industrial expansion in Australia, technological leadership from the US, all to create a resilient, redundant production ecosystem that can outpace any potential adversary. However, the path ahead is not without friction. Parliamentary defense analysts warn of labor shortages, supply chain constraints, and escalating costs. Britain's civilian nuclear sector is already competing for the same skilled technicians that the AUKUS program will require. Education and training pipelines will need to expand rapidly, and collaboration with Australian and American workforces will become essential. The Strategic Defense Review acknowledges these challenges but proposes mitigation through technical education programs, long-term supplier contracts, and a new trans AUKUS mobility framework allowing skilled personnel to move between partner nations. Still, the question lingers, can Britain afford this pace? Continuous nuclear submarine production demands not just funding but political will. It means long-term commitments across successive governments, something British defense policy has rarely maintained, yet the stakes are too high for half measures. In an age where naval presence defines strategic influence, falling behind in undersea capability would mean ceding initiative to competitors who are already expanding their fleets at unprecedented rates. What this all represents is not a return to Cold War rearmament, but a recognition that deterrence today is as much industrial as it is military. Whoever controls the shipyards, the supply chains, and the workforce controls time, and in strategic terms, time is deterrence. For Britain, the 18-month submarine cycle is a message to allies and adversaries alike. The Royal Navy will not fade into obsolescence. Instead, it will anchor the Western Alliance's presence beneath the world's oceans for generations. It ensures that AUKUS isn't just a treaty, it's an engine. An engine that turns political promises into physical power, steel into sovereignty, and cooperation into deterrence. In the end, the decision to build a new nuclear submarine every 18 months is about more than shipbuilding. It's about endurance, industrial, strategic, and political. The UK has chosen to define its role not by the number of submarines it owns, but by its ability to keep building them. That rhythm, steady and relentless, will shape the balance of power beneath the waves for decades to come.